Okay, today's learning is going to be dedicated Lila Nishmas David Shimon Ben Nachum. That's my father in law, blessed memory. We are up now to chapter seven in Shari Yichid Vemuna. And as promised in the introductory line to the objective of this whole book of the Tanya, this whole section, we are going to now finally address the difference between what is called Yichud Ilah and Yichud Tata as manifest in the two psukim, the two verses of Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, and Baruch Shein Kavod, Machus Elielam Vod. So before I speak, I'd like to say a few words. So some introductory ideas as to what I just said. Uh, when the Alter Rebbe, as we talked about, wrote what we call the Tanya, it's important that we remember that they were initially individual books. There was the book of the intermediate man, the Sefer Shel Beninim, which is the first section of what we call the Tanya. And there was this book that we are studying now, which is Shar Yichid Bamuna, the Gate of Unity and Belief. And the Alter Rebbe initially actually planned to, to, to publish and distribute this section of Tanya, the Shar Yichid Bamuna, before the Sefer Shel Beninim. And the logic there being that before we can talk about the relationship with Hashem, which is the concept, the context, and concept and objective of the Sefer Shal Beninim, the book of the intermediate man, we first have to know who Hashem is. And that's the, what's addressed in the book of, uh, uh, of unity and belief, Shari Bamuna, which we are doing now. However, the Alter Rebbe uh, zigged instead of zag, and he decided to first uh, publish and produce and distribute the book of the intermediate man, in part because he came to recognize that the situation was so desperate that we couldn't first go to medical school, we first needed to learn how to do some triage first aid because the Yidin were in danger of being so um, numb to the infinity of Hashem that they weren't gonna even get the message. So we had to go right to the, uh, 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 the, the triage with the intermediate man. But now we are in this chapter, in this uh, section, we are discussing what is Hashem when we talk about God? Now, uh, as we talked about on Shabbos, it's the endless pursuit of the unattainable. You're never going to get the answer. You're never going to get to the end. This is the metaphor from the uh, absence of satisfaction from the Mun. One of the reasons why the Mun was considered a test and not satisfactory, even though it was there every day, is because you never got it. There was enough for that day, and then tomorrow you need it again. So there was always that sense of uncertainty, which is a, a virtuous thing because it, it encourages this endless pursuit as we are discussing. Now, the Alter Rebbe, and if you go back, way back even in the sense before chapter one, there's a little introductory line. And the little introductory line reads that it is our objective to understand a little bit, and we talked about that, that the Alter Rebbe uses a double expression, ma'at mezer, a little bit is how we would translate it in English, or, or a little, little. Ma'at is Hebrew, mezer is also small, tiny, a little bit. This that it says in the Zohar, that the Pasuk Shema Yisrael, we all recognize that here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, it was just in last week's Parsha, in this one, two weeks ago. That is what is called Yehuda Ilah. Yehuda Ilah, we would translate it's Aramaic, is the higher unification. Oh, well, that helps. We're going to talk about what do we mean the higher unification. We'll get to it. And Baruch Shein Kavod Machus Void. Blessed is the name and the glory of his kingdom. Underline that in your mind. Kingdom uh, forever and ever. And we'll talk about that. Forever and beyond. What is forever and beyond? We'll talk about that. And that is not in last week's parsha. meaning we say, if you look in the Torah, we say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, Shema Yisrael, Hashem, Akin, Hashem, Echad. And it goes immediately into, V'yahavtes Hashem, Lekech, you should love the Lord your God. And we, that is, we inserted Torah, uh, the Rabbanan inserted a line that's not in Torah, which we say in an undertone, except on Yom Kippur, which we'll talk about, why? And we say, blessed is the name and the glory of his kingdom, and again, that's the line, that's the word, that's really the key word here, forever and ever. Now, why Chazal instituted that to interrupt uh, two consecutive verses in Torah is certainly worth noting. Like we don't tend to want to play around 
with direct quotes from Torah, especially when you're talking about the centerpiece of the declaration of our faith and our uh, uh, affirmation of the absolute singularity of Hashem. So why did Chazal find it valuable and necessary to insert it? And why do we say it in an undertone, which we'll talk about as well? Now, that, Baruch Shein Kvayim Chusul Voyed, the Alter Rebbe tells us, quotes from the Zohar, is Yehuda Tata, the lower level of unity. Ah, what is lower level of unity? What is higher level of unity? Well, you've come to the right place. That's what we're going to be talking about now, finally here in chapter seven. Now, not unlike the uh, Sefer Shalbain in the Book of the Intermediate Man, where the Alter Rebbe tells us on the title page that the objective is the explanation of the verse, behold, it is very, the, this matter is very near to you in your uh, heart and in your mouth that you may do it. And then you, one might anticipate, okay, page one, let's look at this verse and let's see what the question is, as we often do. We, we, we raise a, a thesis, we raise an antithesis, and we come up with some sort of synthesis but rather, we don't even address the verse of Kikara Ve'lech. I'm talking now in the book of the Intermediate Man. We don't even address that. We don't even talk about it until chapter 17. Why? Because until you have all the information in the first 16 chapters, we're talking now about the book of the Intermediate Man, you don't even recognize what is the issue and what is the question about uh, this verse, why it's not just a pretty straight up verse that uh, seems to be um, self-evident. Well, in a similar sense, the Alter Rebbe does the same strategy here. He tells us before we even begin the, um, the book uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, unity and belief, that this is our objective to describe how the Shema, that line, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elkein Hashem Echad, is this elusive concept called Yehuda Ilah, and Baruch Shein Kavod Mechusu Ilam Void is this elusive concept called Yehuda Tata. But he doesn't talk about it for the first chapter. He only now finally comes to chapter seven. So the question is, what is it that we needed to know before we could come to understand the, these concepts? What is the background? This isn't just a teaser to sort of get you to click here so that you'll pay attention. Why couldn't we just have jumped right in to that uh, issue in the very beginning of Shari Chet Bamuna? Why did we first need to talk about all these other ideas before we were prepped to address this conceptual issue? So in order to understand this, we got to back up another step. And again, I know that it feels like it's just an endless progression, but I think hopefully we'll be able to string this together into something that seems systematic. Certainly the Alter Rebbe, was deliberate in the processing. I mean, that's the whole strategy of Chabad, is that there's a system and there's a, um, a, a sequence that we can try to connect the dots from point to point. That is the whole process of Tzimtzum, that it begins at a, at a certain starting point, though that may be somewhat uh, arbitrary because God is ultimately infinite. You can't go all the way back to the beginning. And then we work our way through conceptually, structurally, as we sort of check the different boxes and we get to where we can have something substantive that we can wrap our arms around. So a basic point, which we are all familiar with, and sometimes we're so familiar with it that we miss a certain obvious uh, issue. There's a, a term we use it mostly in Talmud study. We call it a klutz kasha. The word klutz, which we associate with someone who's uh, 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 accident prone more literally means a block of wood so a klutz kasha means something that you trip over because it's so uh, it's so obstructive but sometimes something is so obstructive we don't even think about it. so there's a klutz kasha that needs to be addressed we are familiar with the term that God created the world and in Hebrew yesh mi'ayin translation something from nothing so the klutz kasha is in that phrase, which we are all familiar with, and we've used it dozens of times, yesh, mi'ay, and something from nothing, there's a basic question, because that premise states that we are something, and the source of our creation, which is God, is nothing. So how come we, re we refer to the world as something, yesh, and Hashem as ayin, as nothing? Why don't we call it ayin, mi'yesh, nothing from something? 
Why do we call yesh mi'ayin something from nothing, suggesting that we are something and God is nothing? Why don't we call it ayin yesh, a no thing, because we don't have infinite sustainability or even independent sustainability. Remember we, how much we talked about that? Like if you throw a ball, it looks like the ball is flying. But of course, the ball is only flying because energy was dispatched into it. And when that energy expires, the ball is going to return to its more natural state of being on the ground. So why do we call it yesh miyayin? Why don't we call it ayin yesh? And the answer is these two ideas. This is what we mean by the supernal unity and the lower level unity. Now, again, like we've talked about in other contexts as well, when we talk about higher and lower, we don't mean better and worse. We don't mean advanced and uh, simple. We don't mean beginners and, uh, 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 and um, uh, an expert. We mean two different perspectives. From our perspective, we are a thing. You know, this is tangible, physical. I see the desk, the chair, the book. These are things that I recognize. And we uh, uh, conceptually understand that there is also a no thing. There is the that which is not a thing. We've talked about this so often. God is not a thing because he's not measurable. We do this intuitively, and it's even become structured, for example, in our davening. We look at the structure of davening. Every morning we wake up, and what wakes us up, what is it that rejoins our neshama to our body? Because we're all familiar with the idea that when a person sleeps, his neshama is returned to shamayim temporarily. What wakes us up is the, the, the stimulus of our senses. So the alarm, noise, uh, light, uh, vision, uh, for someone's in a real deep, almost unconscious state, there's a smelling salts, taste, touch, someone shakes you and you wake up and you wake up. So when our humanity becomes stimulated, we awake. When we awake, we begin with one premise, which is I exist. So we wake up and we think I'm here, I'm tired, I'm late. This is what I have to do today. This is where I'm gonna go today. This is what I want for today. We begin with the premise of our own existence. And then we set about trying to see the ayin, the non, that is the infinite of Hashem within our own existence. And then we hope to even reach a level where we are beyond seeing even our own identity at all, excuse me, and only see the infinity of Hashem. So to follow the, just the, the layout of the davening for, for a moment, What's the beginning of davening? First, we say, we acknowledge I am, I exist, and therefore I have gratitude to Hashem that he has returned my soul. We do the morning brachas, and we acknowledge that all of the things that we enjoy or like or appreciate about our existence, vision, mobility, strength, etc., are all a gift from Hashem. So I exist, and I thank you, Hashem, for giving me my existence. And then we move along and we move to a more sort of uh, other centered, Hashem centered. <coughs> Excuse me. So we start with the verses of praise, the Psuke de Zimra, which are mostly quotes from Tehillim, but not entirely, where we talk about the praises of Hashem beyond just what Hashem does for me, that Hashem gives me my ability for, mo for vision, mobility, strength, etc. And we talk about how even the angels praise Hashem. So if the angels for whom I have this reverence, if they praise Hashem, certainly I'm going to praise Hashem. So we talk about that. And then we come to the Shema, where we cover our eyes. You know, you see where we're headed here. And we declare that Hashem is the sole determinant of our behavior. We say that God is one. We don't just mean there's only one God, like there's only one book on the table. We mean that God is the sole determinant of my behavior. This is why the Shema is associated with Mesir Nefesh. We know the great heroic stories of, our, uh, uh, of the great people who went to their death. Why did they declare the Shema? Why did they declare Torah Tziva, that the Torah that God commanded us? Because we're commanded to, to go to Mesir Nefesh. Why is it specifically the Shema? Why did they declare Bereshis, that God created the world? So one interpretation is because it is the message of the Shema that leads one to Mesir Nefesh. 
Mesiris Nefesh means that the only determinant in my life is Hashem, not, God forbid, the gun or the you'll make a lot of money or whatever the temptation is that is dangling before one's eyes that might potentially distract them from the service of Hashem or the commitment to Hashem. Rather, it is only Hashem. And then, just to take that one step further, the ultimate surrender is the Amida, which is why we stand with our feet together. We are immobilized. And seemingly, we should just be silent. We're standing before Hashem. That's why the opening line of the Amida reads, Hashem, my lips open and my mouth shall declare your praises. Meaning, I'm standing before Hashem. I should be quiet. Why am I talking? I should be listening only because we ask Hashem. I mean, it's kind of ironic. Hashem, please help me to uh, bespeak your praises. Okay. So what we attempt to do is while beginning with the, pre the, the presumption of our own existence and then working towards the understanding that our existence is surrendered to Hashem, that's the Ein Od Milvado, we come to a, we, we hope to come, or at least touch, or at least be aware, even if we can never actually manifest it, to a level where there's nothing else but Hashem. There's only Hashem. It's not just that everything is surrendered to Hashem and the table and the mountain and everything is surrendered to Hashem. It's, there is no other existence. There's only Hashem. This is that level that is declared in Ain Oak. So now we go back. And we said, what is it that we, we needed to lay out in order to understand what the difference is between the declaration of the Shema and the declaration of Baruch Shein, Kavod Mechusul and Boy, blessed is the name and the glory of his kingdom forever and ever. And the, the key word there is the word kingdom, which we're, we're, we're going to emphasize a lot. And I, I want to remind you of that. So it should be uh, clear. Because in the first chapter, we talked about the quote we also just had in the parsha two weeks ago of you should know this day and take it unto heart that Hashem in the heavens above and the earth below, there is no other. And we asked the question, like that seems like a lot of drama for a pretty straightforward statement. I mean, you, if, by, if you, by the time you get to Deuteronomy, you should know that there's only one God. I mean, that's so basic that it doesn't seem to uh, warrant such drama and, uh, of an introduction. Know this day and take it unto heart. But now we start to understand when we say there's nothing else, we don't just mean there's not another God, there's not some competitive God, that we're not just polytheists, and et cetera, et cetera. It is to say that there is only one. Why is that so shocking? Then we went on to say, well, what about all the different names we have of Hashem, the different ways in which Hashem manifests himself? Hashem as infinite, that is, without the parameters even of time, the four-letter name of Hashem, Yud and He and Vav and He which is all the different forms of tense, past tense, haya, present tense, hove, future tense, yiya, which are all comprised of those letters of the four-letter name of Hashem. And then we have the Hashem of Elohim, who is the Hashem, the creator, like we talked about, that when we're first introduced, so to speak, to Hashem, it's in the beginning, Elohim creates. And we talked about that, you know, who is the narrator? Why is Torah not in the first person? Why doesn't it say in the beginning, I created, then I said, because it's Hashem's essence that is, that is narrating the story in the manner in which Hashem is expressing himself. Hashem as Elohim, Hashem as four-letter yud ke vav ke, all of those different parameters, which we discussed at some length. We talked about the lights within the vessels. That was a big part in chapters four and five, about the whole concept of vessels and lights and bringing them together. This is another crucial characteristic that we have now laid out. So it's only because we have that background. You know, it's like the classic thing. The child goes to math class. They learn two plus two is four. They figure, okay, I've mastered all of math. And then all of a sudden you introduce engineering and physics and trigonometry. And they go, oh, wait, wait, there's a whole bunch more going on over there. So the Alter Rebbe began the Shari Chava Muna with the declarative that our objective here is to explain the difference between the, the oneness of Hashem from Hashem's perspective and the oneness of Hashem from our perspective. Now, in the second half of the chapter, we're going to throw in another idea, which we won't get to today. It's one that we're familiar with because we say it every morning in the davening. 
and it is the, it is the declarative in Hebrew, Ani Hashem Shanisi. Translation, I am Hashem, I do not change. So we asked the question, what do you mean you don't change? One day there was only Hashem, then there was a creation. What do you mean Hashem doesn't change? Don't we believe that we can persuade Hashem to change things based on our behavior when we do mitzvahs, when we daven? So what, do we, what does it mean, I am Hashem, I do not change? What is the, the meaning of this idea? And all of this, as you can imagine, is based on the concept of tzimtzum. And again, remember, tzimtzum is the presentation that Hashem is not overwhelmingly obvious. Remember the metaphor that we talked a lot about, or the analogy of the sun and the screen that keeps us from being overwhelmed by the sun. So we identify individual sun rays and we only can conceptually sort of trace them back to the sun globe and see that the individual sun ray has no independent, and that's the key word, existence. Its existence is exclusively the product of that which is driving it, the sun globe. And this idea that I, that I am Hashem, I do not change, even though it appears to change in our mind or in our perception, better, in our perception. So this is where we're headed now. What drives the tzimtzum? I mean, this is a curious point. That's we we know it because Hasidus emphasizes it time and time again. It, but it curiously is not addressed directly in Torah. We know Torah begins with Hashem's description that at the beginning of creation, Hashem created the heavens and the earth, and it said this and all of the story. But what doesn't get addressed explicitly is what drives Hashem to create the world. Why does Hashem create the world? And that, that's not addressed. Now, the Talmud takes on this question, and uh, the Medrash takes on this question, and we know this because Hasidus is constantly emphasizing it and pounding it home, that the answer is two words, that God has a passion, and that's the key, because it, the only time that in all the suggestions as to why Hashem created the world the only time it offers a, uh, a, a, a term that speaks about Hashem exclusively, independently of the creation, is that Medrash Tan Chuma Parshas Nasai that says that Hashem has a taiva, which sounds funny because we tend to associate the word taiva with selfish indulgences, but taiva is not innately, quote, a bad or flaw. It depends what the taiva is for. Hashem has a taiva for a welcoming place to be made for him, not that he makes it, that we make it for him in the least evident of our uh, life circumstances, the dear of Now, the Talmud also suggests that Hashem creates the world because he wants to do good. But of course, that only begs the question, if we're not here, there's no one to do good for. I mean, I don't go and find somebody so I can drag him across the street because I want to help people across the street. What if he doesn't want to go across the street, et cetera? And I, as ironic as it sounds, sometimes we could fall prey to this. You know, <laughs> it's the old joke that's that's more true than funny. You know, the kid goes on Mifzah, and he says to somebody, are you Jewish? Yes. Did you put on the film today? I did. Oh, crap. <laughs> you know, I wanted to put on the film with you. You did already? Oh, that's a bummer. You know, so of course, that's not the goal. The goal is to find somebody who hasn't put on tefillin. But you can understand, you know, if that's our kid's worst uh, flaw, it's not so bad. Um, this idea that, uh, that Hashem is, that the distinction about this quote from the Medrash, which the Hasidus put so much emphasis on, which just amongst us, I could tell you, nobody can tell you what it says in the line before. And said, you know, we say it so obviously, oh, of course, everyone knows that. We wouldn't know it either, except the Alter Rebbe, brought it to our attention in the book of the Intermediate Man, way back when, that this is the whole purpose. This is the entirety of man and the whole objective of creation, to make this world a dwelling place for Hashem. <clears throat> now, the distinctive characteristic that is indicated in that phrase, nisava, Hashem has a taiva, is that it's not reactive to something else. It's not meaning. Uh, uh, when a person says, can you help me? So then I want to be helpful. It's, it's reactive. 
when a person just has an innate desire for it, it's not about the need of the other, it's about Hashem's innate impulse for it. Hashem has the desire for it, independent of whether anybody is asking him because nobody asked you. Who asked you to create the world? Nobody asked you to create the world. Okay, so with this lengthy introduction, we are able to start to talk about the Shema. Now, in the history of the Shema, the first time that we have, it's not in the Chumash, of course, but the first time that the term or the phrase of Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alekeinu, Hashem Echad, was uttered, the Medrash tells us, was with Yaakov Avinu and his sons. So you recall that in Parshas Vayichi, which is the last Parsha of the book of Genesis, the book of Bereshis, Yaakov Avinu and his whole family, everyone lives in Mitzrayim. So they're in the worst place. They're out of They're out of the natural habitat of Eretz Yisrael. They're living in, in Egypt, and things are good at this point, which is its own type of slavery. We become enslaved to the comforts of Egypt. Yosef is running the show. The, the, the brothers and the family are all living in, uh, in, in Goshen, and life is good. And Yaakov Avinu, of course, has a fear. His fear is that when he dies, you know, they're going to stop humoring the old man, and they're all going to become Egyptian. That till now, everybody's been playing nicely nice because he's an old man and they're nice to him. But as soon as he dies, you know, we're out of here. So he calls in all of his sons. This we have in the Chumash. And what we have in the Chumash is that he gives them all the bracha. But we also have an indication that he sort of asks them, you know, sort of level with me. Is this yours or are you just doing it to humor me? So they respond, the Medrash says, Shema Yisroel, hear us. Israel. Now, why here? In part because Yaakov was also blind. We have that story with Yosef bringing his sons and he crosses his arms. And then, as we explain in Hasidus, that hearing penetrates more deeply. It's why we cover our eyes when we say the Shema, because when we see something, we tend to only see the surface of it and we don't really explore it. Whereas when I have to listen to somebody describe it to me, it's far more intense, it's not shallow. So they say Shema Yisroel. Remember, Yaakov's name was changed to Yisroel, but he still used the word, the, 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 the name Yaakov was still used because Yaakov suggests obedience, the heel, and Yisroel suggests this more, uh, I'll call it, matured level of understanding that he was awarded post his victory with the wrestling, with the... Um, with the angel of Asaph. So they say to him, Shema Yisroel, Hashem is Elokeinu, he's our God. I Meaning he's not your God, and we're just sort of humoring you and playing along. He's ours. Hashem, Echad, he is the sole determinant, not Egyptian prominence, wealth, and so on. So your concern is not a concern. So Hashem is ours. So Yaakov Avinu said, or some, they read it as the angels declared it, and Yaakov grabbed it away from the angels, and he said, Baruch Shein, blessed is his name, Kavoyim Machusai, the glory of his kingdom, Le'elam Void forever. Now, we inserted this, you know, the Rabbanan inserted this in the davening, like I mentioned, it's not in the Pasuk. In Torah, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elkein Hashem Echad, goes right into the paragraph, you shall love the Lord your God with all your might, and so on, which is that total bittal, all, all your everything, all your heart, uh, all your soul, all your everything, everything, even if they take your life, everything, there's no other thing, which we talk about. What is Yaakov uh, inserting this for, and why is it in incorporated in what we call the Kriyashma? We always say it that way. Why? So a number of things. One reason why we say it silently is because it's not in the Chumash, and it's a little bit like a chutzpah, you know, we've inter interjected it. Others say because we took it from the angels. That's why on Yom Kippur, when we're like angels, we don't have to be shy about it. We can just declare it. Another interpretation is it's not a knowable. How can you know that something will be forever? We only know, we, we don't even know what has happened already. How can we know what the future will be? That's a level that Yaakov Avinu, the level of angels. So it's sort of going outside the rules to declare it will be forever. Because again, that's the future. We can't know the future. And then as we are going to examine that there is a, a meaning beyond the literal 
that aligns these two verses, but different perspectives. And the key there is going to be that word malchus, as we have talked about in so many different ways, based on the Pasuk and Divrei Hayamim, Chronicles, that we say every day in the davening. We also say it, it's in the standard davening. We also say it when we take out the Torah, that we ascribe to Hashem seven midos, seven identifiables. And the last one is mamlocha. Now, we're almost going to be Rosh Hashanah in a couple of weeks, so it's another opportunity. When we say that Hashem is king, we might ask, well, what happens if, God forbid, nobody showed up to blow the shofar? So then what, Hashem is out of a job? What does that mean that we have to, we make Hashem the king? Well, in part, we think that king, wow, that's the highest level, but it's, it's really the lowest level for Hashem. Meaning, you think Hashem has nothing else to do than take care of us? He has plenty of other things to do. If nobody shows up and we don't blow the shofar, then Hashem is just the boss. He's just the authority. The king suggests a personal relationship. When we ask Hashem to be our king, what we're saying is, Hashem, will you please make us your priority like a king makes his people his priority? Otherwise, you're just a detached uh, dictator. Even if you're a benevolent dictator, you're just a detached dictator from some abstract place that's not immediately meaningful to us. So by Hashem, willing to be a king means he's willing to draw his attention. We use this phrase, it sounds a little more insulting than it's intended. He lowers himself, but that's not meant to be condescending. That means you talk down to people like they don't know big words. It's not, it's not Hashem being condescending. Okay, I'll buy. It's saying, Hashem, will you make us your priority? So on the one hand, it's very attenuated to our individualism which is pretty routine stuff. You know, make sure my crops grow, I'm healthy, my children are healthy, all the things that we ask for, which, you know, for Hashem, that seems rather pedestrian. And at the same time, it's remembering that Hashem's the king, he's not my bud. You know, there's still that sort of detachment and separation. So this is what Yaakov Avinu was saying. The fact that you can declare Shema Yisrael when you, are, you have the option of sitting in the palace of Egypt. And yet you're going to bring Hashem down into the most seemingly ordinary, that's dear betachtein, like a parent and a child. Every child for a time immemorial in every school that they've ever gone to has always learned the same thing, nothing. Because you say to the kid, what'd you learn this week? Nothing. How was school this week? Nothing. What, tell me something you learned, nothing. Why? Because the parent is saying to the child, let me into your life. Take me into the ordinary routine, not the drama of some. And the kid says, leave me alone. Nothing. What did you learn? Nothing. In other words, the kid's saying, don't bother me. And the parent is saying, please, I want to be in your, in your life. What is the great bracha? When the child says to the parent, this is what I learned. Meaning, welcome into my life. I, as the parent, so fascinated specifically with the chumash pasuk that they learned or this bit of Gemara, not necessarily. What they are fascinated with, what they are obsessed with, is the child allowing the parent into, the, into their life, where the child could say, you know, basically leave me alone. So this is the great bracha, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> the great uh, passion that the, that the parent has to be welcomed into the child. This is what Hashem wants. He wants to be welcomed within our most ordinary of life experiences. And that's what Yaakov Avinu declared <laughs> by using the term shame, God's name, because a name is not something for myself, a name, like we would say, like a phone number. I only need it because somebody else, in order for somebody else to get in touch with me, I don't need a name for myself. I need a name so other people can get my attention. And Malchus, which again is the relationship characteristic that Hashem has with the Jewish people. Okay, so I know it took half an hour to do the introduction. Now we're going to learn some Tanya. All right, here we go. Perexite, Ubeze. You see, it begins with the letter Vav, which again underscores, as we talked about, that in order for us to finally address what was declared to be the objective of the entirety of this book, Shaykh Vamuna, we had to first have all of this introductory chapters, like we talked about in the Sefer Shalbanin. 
Yuvan Mashakasa Bezoyah HaKadosh. We can now understand what it says in the Zohar. Now, curiously, the Zohar is often called the Zohar or the Zohar HaKadosh, the Holy Zohar. So, and again, in our never-ending pursuit of overanalyzing every word, we might ask, why does the Alter Rebbe decide to refer in this context to the Zohar as the Zohar HaKadosh, the Holy Zohar? Everything is holy. Chumash is holy. Gemara is holy. We don't always use that. Sometimes we just say the Zayar, and everybody knows what we're referring to. So there is a suggestion that since the word Kadosh means separated, like we've always talked about, we make Kiddush on Friday night to say this is a separate entity. It's not like Wednesday to Thursday. It is different. And even Habdullah in the Gemara is referred to as Kiddush because it's also a separation. Um, and that the word Havdalah means separated. So the author is saying, and again, this is the whole of, I shouldn't say the whole, this is a, a, a significant objective of Tanya that we take the Zayr HaKadosh, the Zayr, which was like off limits. It was like odd. It was like detached. It was, I don't mean this in a derogatory sense, it was strange. It was other. And we make it meaningful and practical. Because again, when you lay out the phrase that Shema is Yehudi Ilah, and Baruch Shem Zichud Tata. Even if I translate that into English, and I say this is the supernal unity, and this is the lower unity, it's still Kadosh. It's still some detached concept that I don't really incorporate or personalize. What was this thing? The Pasuk Shema Yisrael, the Pasuk of Shema Yisrael, and that's a Pasuk. Pasuk, the word Pasuk means it's in Tanakh. We don't co- quote something from um, the Shulchan Aruch, we don't call that a Pasuk. When something's in the Medrash, we don't call that a Pasuk. Pasuk, the word Pasuk, which translates as verse, but the word Pasuk is exclusively reserved for Tanakh. And I think the Alter Rebbe is alluding to this, because of course we all know Shema Yisrael is in the Chumash, so why does he have to emphasize? Because it's a Pasuk. And here's the curiosity that we, we indicated. Why did Chazal, when they set up the davening and such a central part of the davening, which is the recitation of the Shema, just as an example, the very first subject discussed in all of the Talmud is the Shema. When do you recite the morning Shema and so on? So the Shema is clearly a biggie. So it's odd that Chazal would tinker with a, a, a direct quote from Torah. Because again, in Torah it says, Shema Yisrael Hashem and Kedosh Hashem That's the Pasuk. And it says, V'yahavta. And yet we interjected, Ubaruch Shem Kavayin Machutz Olam Void, which is not a Pasuk. That was a declaration that came from, um, from the angels, Yaakov Avinu, as we talked about in that story. Why? So that's really, uh, I'll call it aggressive, for the, for the Chachamim to institute that idea right there to, to tinker with the Pusik. So I think the Alter Rebbe is sort of really underscoring, hey, wait, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, we, that, that really seems odd. You know, we, when, when it comes to this whole interesting discussion, when it comes to um, statements in the Talmud, so we do that not infrequently, not cavalierly, you know, we sort of paraphrase. We, we, don't, we don't always quote things absolutely directly. We do a little bit of a paraphrase because it's simpler, it's shorthand and so on. But when it comes to a Pusk and Chumash, especially when it's the centerpiece of our davening, it really is unexpected that, uh, that Chazal would, like I say, tinker with. That is Yehuda Tata, the unity, the oneness of Hashem from our perspective. So Shema is Hashem's perspective. Baruch Shem is our perspective, which we'll get to. So here we go. Ki va'ad va'ed hu echad b'chalufi asuvin. Now, here is a, you got to have to work with me here on a bit of a visualization. The word echad is spelled aleph ches dalet. That is the word echad. The word va'ed is spelled vav ayin dalet. Now, Sin Shariyichid Bamuna is getting us a little bit outside of just the rigid narrative, the, the absolute literal, and it's allowing us some creativity and some flexibility. So the Alter Rebbe illustrates to us that a, an overlap 
between the two words, echad and va'ed. See, here's how it works. Um, the, the letter aleph becomes linked with the letter vav. How do aleph and vav, I mean, how do we uh, align these two letters? Remember, aleph, echad, the first letter, vav, va'ed, the first letter. What's the connection? This isn't just random. We don't just get to make it up and say that we can uh, see a similarity between Aleph and Bob. Maybe let me back up even one step further. We are familiar with ways in which we draw alignments between apparently completely disparate words. We talked about it, the example with Elohim being the same gematria. Remember, each Hebrew letter is also a number symbol and the numerical totality of the letters as number symbols of the word Elohim is identical with the number value of the letters of the word Hateva, the state of nature. And we explain that every, uh, uh, let's look at it this way, we go top down. Okay, as I keep interrupting myself, maybe this is a different way to start. Everybody comes from Adam and Chava. So there's absolute unity between all of humanity. Why then is it more obvious that I'm related to my brother than it is that I'm related to some total stranger who lives in a different continent? Because the trickle down is, is less extreme in the relationship between me and my brother, because I can go right to my parents. If I go to their parents and cousins and their parents and second cousins and their parents and on and on and on, if I could go all the way back to all them, I would see. So what gematria is, and what we're talking about here, which is called in, in Hebrew, chalufi oisius, a, a, a system for swapping out letters, is another mechanism to take us one step behind the scenes to see an interaction between apparently disparate ideas. So on the one hand, when it comes to letters in particular, every letter has to have its own identity. We have Aleph is different than base. It has to be. And an example of that is illustrated in a Torah scroll or a mezuzah or a tefillin, where every letter has to have its own identity. If two letters are touching, it has to be fixed. It, it, the, the Torah can't be used, the mezuzah is puzzle, whatever it is, if two letters are touching. Concurrently, letters allow us to flow into words. And if you think back to when you learn how to read, you learn individual letters, you learn how to join the letters, and then all of a sudden they become words to the point that you don't even see them as letters. So if I look at Aleph Chestal and I just see Echad, I don't even think about the letters anymore because the letters have individuality and they have cooperation. This is why human beings are referred to as speakers or communicators because the distinctive quality of human beings is our ability for cooperation that people can work together. And this becomes indicated within letters. So the first thing Hashem created is letters. So while letters contain absolute rigid individualism and Aleph is absolutely distinct from Bayes, concurrently, they have a fluidity that allows for cooperation amongst each of these individual letters. They can work together as we would describe it. They can cooperate. They can operate together. This is one of the gifts of letters. Now, again, every letter has an individual. But then there's categories of letters and ways in which we have traditions, and we don't make this up on our own, like with gematrias. It's not just something that, although it sometimes feels like it's a game, it isn't. So now back to the letters that we're looking at. We're looking at the word echad, aleph chestalid, we're looking at the word va'ed, vav ayin dalet. <coughs> so we are quoting, and again, this point is not original with the Alter Rebbe, that the aleph and vav, the first letter of each of these two words, have a relationship. What's the connection between them? Why should aleph be more relevant to vav than it is to base? One reason is because both of them are uh, prefix letters. You know, in Hebrew, the way in which we change tense of a, uh, a, a, of a word is through the um, prefix. Holech is to walk. Eilech, I will walk. Vav is also a prefix. It means and. If I say kise is chair, shulchan is table. If I want to say chair and table, I add a vav to the second word. Kise vishulchan. 
So again, there is a connection. Yes, it's not a direct, literal, tangible connection. It's a more infinite connection. It requires us to step beyond, and that's what we're looking to do here. We're trying to step out of our reality, which says, what do you mean? Aleph is Aleph, Bayes is Bayes. That's the reality that we live with. Today is not yesterday, it's not tomorrow. We are here and not there. Blue is different than red. Up is separate from down. That's the world that we live in. And we're trying to step beyond that. So in order to do that, we have to have flexibility. It's very discomforting. Because, well, what do you mean? Is it up, up or down, in or out, right or left? That's what we are comfortable with because it's predictable. And here we've moved into the less predictable. So Aleph and Vav are swappable or comparable or similar. Then we have Ches and Ayin, the second letter of each. Aleph, Ches, Dalet, Vav, Ayin, Dalet. What's the connection there? That they are letters that are grouped from the throat. Remember we talked about that creation is uh, effectuated through speech. God said the letters Ayin and Ches, now we Ashkenazim are a little more sloppy, but Sephardim are much more particular about this. But Ches really comes from the Ches, or really from the deep throat, and Oyin. We tend to use ayin like we use an olive, and we just say ah, but it's really an oyin. It really comes from, the, from the, the depth of the throat. So they fall into a category. We'll see this later on. Aleph, ches, hey, ayin, they are one group. The bays, vav, men, pay, they're another group from the lips, from the throat, the larynx. Hopefully we don't have to think about it because it's natural. But if you speak to someone who's in some sort of speech therapy the, and somebody who has to be more conscious about their renunciation. So they're more uh, deliberate, you know, God forbid we ever have to find out about it. It's like walking. We don't think about it, we just go, amen. God forbid somebody has some sort of difficulty, they're much more consciously aware of it. So that swaps out the Aleph and the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Ches and the, and the Ayin. And then the Dalit is the same, that's the easy one. <laughs> we have Dalit of Echod and Dalit of Va'et. Now, we don't just throw out these ideas as, as being uh, comparables and ways in which we find connections. There is something a little bit more even uh, uh, aware about it. First of all, when an aleph becomes a vav, so again, if you imagine the shape of an aleph, and there's a story that's recorded in Hayyim Yayim, that when the Alter Rebbe, again, had his son who grew up to be the Mittal Rebbe, and he got to schooling age. There's no schools, you know, we don't the way we think of it. So they hired tutors. So there was a certain man, I forget his name, and the Alter Rebbe hired him as a tutor. And we have this recorded, like I said, it's in Hayyem Yayim. So when he hires the man, he says to him, look, we both have an obligation. I have to, I'll, I have to educate my son, and you have to make Parnassa. So I'll tell you what, I'll pay you when you teach my son. So he says, this is what, how I want, he gave him an example. And this is, he says, when you teach him Aleph Bays, I want you to teach him Aleph. What is Aleph? So if you just use it in, in sort of the, 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 the imagery, it's a Yud above and a Yud below and a Vav in between. So again, you just imagine it, you know, the sort of slanted Vav with a little Yud on the top and a little inverted Yud on the bottom. Here's your imagination. And we're not talking about our... Uh, uh, mediocre penmanship, we're talking about the way it's written in the scribes uh, writing on a Torah. Or so. so then he explained, what is the message? The Yud above suggests Hashem. Yud K Vav K. Hashem's name begins with Yud. The Yud below suggests the Jewish people, Yisrael. And the Vav connects them. What is the characteristic of Vav? And we'll see this again and again. That Vav, as we mentioned, first of all, it means and. It's a connector. Um, and that is the ultimate connection. It's from above to below. And the very shape of the Vav is a, a vertical line, which again suggests taking what is at, on top down below. And unlike in English, where they teach you penmanship to write from the bottom up, a scribe writes from the top down. Again, maybe we're getting a little too technical here, but in a Torah scroll, the lines are scored. They're not, they're not uh, inked, but they're scored with uh, like some sort of pen. Not a pen is the wrong word, but a, a thing. That's, I don't want to be too technical with you. They have a thing and they make lines. 
And when the scribe writes the letter, every letter begins from the top of the line and goes down. So that's why the yud is sort of dangling up on top. So the vav, if you imagine, like a yud that's been pulled down, been stretched. And in fact, the, there's a word vav, spelled vav vav, which means a hook. Because if you imagine the shape of a vav, it has that little curvature on the top. It's a hook, like a fisherman's hook. It hooks things together. It's a connector. So va'ed, again, which is the last word of the second verse, is the vav is swapped out with the aleph. So the aleph is the aloof, like the word aleph, just like in the English word. It's the same in Hebrew, aloof, A-L-O-O-F, is the same uh, ha homonym, not that there's anything wrong with that, the same homonym as uh, the English word aloof, thank you for laughing, which means separated, detached. So Hashem, the aleph, it's high. It's so high, in fact, just as I know I'm getting a little off uh, uh, topic here, but the, the reason why, or one explanation why the first letter of Torah is not an Aleph, is because Aleph is too detached, and the first letter of the Ten Commandments is Aleph, because we're trying to bring that letter down. So you have Aleph becomes Vav, it's a stretch. It brings it down, it takes the abstract, it makes it immediate. Then we, the, the, the oneness of Hashem. Then we talk about the Ches, what is the ches? Is the chachma. Ches, which is echad, you with me here, becomes total, it's, a, it's chachma. What is chachma? It is the willingness to go beyond what I already know. Like we've talked about so many times, the willingness to be amazed. The, will, the, the receptivity, total bitl, to ideas completely outside of what I am accustomed to. And then what does the ches become? It becomes an ayin. Right, remember echad, aleph ches, dalid, va'ed, vav, ayin, ayin, and the ches. If you imagine them sort of uh, horizontally, uh, or I guess whatever that's called, horizontally on top of each other, the aleph became a vav, the ches becomes an ayin. What is the distinctive quality of ayin? The numerical uh, value of ayin is 70. 70 is the seven midas developed completely by the 10 Midas, which include the intellect, as we have talked about so many times. The message of Chabad is that the intellect rules the heart. We are upright human beings, unlike an animal that's on all fours, where the head, the heart, and the lower parts of the body are all in the same plane. A human being is upright, where the intellect cures and matures the heart. What is maturity? It's mind ruling the heart. What does every parent teach the child? You want it, it's not yours. Meaning, engage your intellect. You're going to eat candy, you're going to get cavities. I still want the candy, but you give me data to restrain and hopefully refine the heart. Mind rules the heart, rules the lower parts of the body. So when the, when the ches, which is, is, is suggestive of chachma, this total conceptual uh, receptivity to that which is completely outside of my life experience, etc., and then it becomes tangibilized in the Midois. I have brought it down here. And then what is the Dalit? The Dalit represents both the Dibor, the spoken word of Hashem, through which he created the, the, uh, the, the world, but it's still attached with Hashem, just like a person's words are still associated with them. That is then manifest into the most ordinary of the four directions, all four directions. And then just to add one more little Nuance to it, if you look at an actual Torah scroll, the word echod, the dalit at the end, is an enlarged dalit. We have this in various times in Torah. Torah doesn't have punctuation. And so one of the ways in which Torah draws attention to specific ideas is by the tradition of there being different sizes to the letter. Sometimes you have a letter, it's smaller than usual. Sometimes you have a letter, it's a little bit split. Sometimes you have a letter that's enlarged. Sometimes you have dots. Different traditions that are passed on in the world of scribes um, that uh, alter the standard. The dalit of echad is an enlarged dalit because even though it's the spoken word, dalit suggesting dibor, it's still absolutely associated with big, with Hashem. It's still Hashem speaking. There's no way you could mistake that. Then when it's manifest down in Egypt with the sons of Yaakov to us in our ordinary, it comes a, a standard dalit because it's not so obviously godly all around us and everywhere. 
it's not so completely godly. It's, it's not trickled down is the wrong word, but it is compressed into our ordinary humanity. So now we have Echad and Va'ed, which on the surface seem to be very separate. One is an abstract idea about the infinity of Hashem. And then we have the pragmatic. Now, this is a classic illustration. We all know this already. I know it's going to sound familiar to everyone. This is a classic illustration of the whole message of Chabad, that up is down and down is up. Meaning, out there in the world, I'm talking about in the world of Torah, there seems to be a sort of bifurcation. There is the lofty, exalted, detached, separated, pious tzaddik who pulls his talus over his head. And then there is the pragmatic, stand up, sit down, lean to the left, don't lean to the left, and all of the, the mechanics of our manifestation. And the two seem to be of separate worlds. They're complementary. I mean, you think about Tishrei, you know, we have Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur these days, and then we have Sukkot, and you say, how are these two things coming to the same month? Well, the Rebbe points out at a wedding, you know, you have the Kabbalist Panim, especially in Chabad, it's so serene and serious and intense, and the chuppah, and then you have the most uh, crazed, um, uh, 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 what's the word, uh, uh, unbridled celebration. <coughs> Excuse me, unbridled, how these two, well, we think, okay, there's two separate things, we're done with that, now we go move on to this. See, this comes along, says, no, 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 they're not two separate, they're a natural progression, they're the same. The same Yom Kippur is the same sukkah. It's the same we don't eat. Now we do eat, and we eat in the sukkah. And the mitzvah is not to the mitzvah is. It's all one and the same. If we could break down that potential barricade or that uh, uh, fence that separates out between the inf infinite of Chachma and the pragmatism of the, uh, of the character, of the oneness and the connectedness of the big dalit and the small dalit, we have, in fact, effectuated the ultimate objective, which is Dir B'tachtein. So this is what the Alter Rebbe is referring to here by saying that they get swapped out. What is the whole purpose of this whole uh, 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 the whole sense that Hashem, like the screen, remember Elohim, keeps out the overwhelming intensity of the light. All the things we talked about, Kalim vessels that contain the light, and that we don't get overwhelmed by the expression of the infinity of Hashem. And Yudke Vavke is manifest through Elohim. What is the goal of all of this? Why does Hashem do all of this? We understand why we appreciate it, because if the sun was taken out of its sheath, it would burn us up. But what motivates Hashem to do this? Again, that's the pre-question. Not how did Hashem create the world and what does he want from the world? Why does Hashem, what is it that pre-motivates uh, uh, Hashem? It's not us. <laughs> we don't exist. So what is that? It is known to everybody, which is a pretty intense le level. That is, it's embedded within our awareness. I mean, this is pretty uh, 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 declarative. The ultimate purpose of creation, who bishvil his scholars malchusa is is the expression of Hashem as Melech. Now again, on the one hand, we say, "Oh, of course, God is the king." But why would God want to be the king? King is a is is a, a demotion for God. He's God. Why do you want to be king? We've had kings. We had good kings, virtuous kings, righteous kings. King David. Why would God want to be king? The president doesn't want to be the vice president. That's a demotion. Why? Because king represents a connected relationship. And in order to be a king, there has to be a people. So we create this. We have an interesting halakhic discussion. We know that there is a mitzvah on kohanim to do what we call the priestly blessing. We call it the duchening. Birchas kohanim. Is there any obligation on the community to provide that opportunity for the Kohen? Meaning the Kohen has an obligation to give the bracha. Who's going to get the bracha? There's got to be a, a recipient to the bracha. So as you can imagine, there's multiple opinions. One opinion suggests, yes, the community has an obligation to create a circumstance that allows the Kohanim to give them the bracha. 
even though it's their mitzvah. I mean, we like it very much and we run around and we make sure that there's Kohanim and so on, but the mitzvah is not on the people. <coughs> the mitzvah of Yechaz Kohanim is on the Kohen. That's why he says the bracha, he is, Hashem has sanctified us with the sanctity of Aaron and commanded us to give the bracha. So the people, yes, they get the benefit of being blessed. Is there any obligation of them to create that environment? The answer is yes. So why do we exist? We exist to be of service to Hashem. This essentially you know, is the whole summary, the whole purpose of creation. Do we say that God is here to serve us? that God is here to make our lives more meaningful and more spiritual and more rewarding, which of course he does. Or do we say that we exist to serve Hashem? So if Hashem exists to serve me, he's not, I don't know if he's doing such a good job because uh, you know I didn't get ice cream yesterday. So maybe he hasn't lived up to it. But if I think about it, it's my job to serve Hashem, so then I'm not worried about whether or not Hashem is doing his job. I'm more concerned about whether I'm doing my job. Uh-huh. That's, the, that's the, the, the distinction. And in order for Hashem to be Melech, not in order for Hashem to be the authority. He's the authority anyway. But in order for there to be Melech, there's got to be Am. Perish Am, what is Am, curiously? The word Am, which we translate as the people. Now, if you look in Torah, we find all different descriptions, descriptives of that. We got Bnei Yisrael, we got Adas Yisrael, the attesters, we testify to God's existence. We have Kahal Yisrael, the community, and we also have Am Yisrael. Am suggests a very basic level. It's like being a citizen. It's, it, there's a difference between being a citizen and being a patriot. A citizen is simply a legal definition. Whether the person votes in their elections, whether they're compliant with the law, they put out a flag on July 4th, they are still a citizen. But if, in order to be a patriot, is about a characteristic. It's about um, a, de- a declarative. It's about activity. So Am suggests the lowest common denominator. Because in order for Hashem to be a king, it has to be willful. You know, a company can buy business. You know, they can give it away at such a ridiculous price that they buy business. And hopefully the people get hooked. And then when they raise the price, the people stay. But sometimes the company finds out and raise the price, people leave. Because people are not loyal to that, but it's so cheap. I, I, why should I? Why should I rent a car when Uber is so cheap? But when Uber stops being so cheap, then I then it becomes the demarcation. Am I really committed to Uber? Or was I just taking advantage of the sale price? So Hashem, in order for him, quote unquote, again, he can do anything he wants, but in order to be a king, there can't be any innate bias of the people. Meaning, if I'm, if I'm a loyal citizen because of something, I'm going to get out of it. So then I'm not really a loyal citizen because tomorrow will come along an alternative. I'll go there. I'm not loyal to my grocery store. I go there because they have a sale. Tomorrow, the next door grocery has a different sale. It's the capitalist system. I go there. So how does, Hash, again, how does the king, Hashem can do whatever he wants. How does the king subject relationship truly work where the subject has absolute free will? There is no innate bias. <laughs> when I was at JLI, Rabbi Friedman told the story. There was a man who called him. It's a long story. And the guy says, you know, he's Jewish, but he's, he, he never had a good experience with Judaism. So Rabbi Friedman says, 3,000 years, we haven't had a lot of good experiences. No one's Jewish because we had good experiences. We had a lot of bad experiences. But we're Jewish because that's our identity. So if you're enticing me with cookies, as soon as the cookies run out, I'm out of here. So Torah, uh, or Hashem, uh, uh, through the, this model, uh, this king model, there's no innate bias of the people. It's, so that's why you can't be a king over your children. Because even though my children tell me that I'm the worst parent ever in the history of parenting, because all the other parents let their kids roller skate on Lakeshore Drive, and I'm so mean that I won't let them, they have no choice. They don't have genuine free choice. They're biased towards uh, their parent. Or if a person's a, a, an officer in the king's court, of course he wants the king to be king because if the king stops being king, then he stops being the minister of uh, doing nothing or whatever it is. So who can truly make the king the king? The people who have absolutely no self-interest, who completely voluntarily 
offer up their loyalty to the king. That's the am level. When we talk about the Jews as an am, we mean they are completely independent. Apparently, they see no natural inclination towards Hashem. They don't see it at any level. They don't see it at any level. And then they voluntarily commit. So then they're not going to abandon ship when the better service comes along. And again, it's, an, it's often a confused idea. All right, we'll stop here and we'll continue next to Vach. Have a good week, everybody. Again, I know I apologize for my sense of rambling, but hopefully.